Hello, everyone. Dr. Ken Berry here. I'm going to hang out with you guys for the next hour, give or take, and answer all the questions that I can that you have about eating a proper human diet or intermittent fasting, medications you may be taking, medical conditions you may currently be suffering from. Uh, I'm going to be all yours. I'm live on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. If you don't follow me on one of those other social medias, don't forget to follow me over there. The more follows, the more people we can reach. I am, for those of you who don't know, I'm a family physician. I've been practicing family medicine in Tennessee in the United States for over 20 years. I still have a very small private practice, but I've devoted the majority of my time to uh, answering questions, to helping people understand what a proper human diet even is. Is there such a thing? When should I eat? When should I not eat? Um, and also working on a couple of other books. I already have one book that's been published called Lies My Doctor Told Me. Um, Mr. Vegas, you know I don't have an accent. People say this about me all the time. Oh, you, I love your accent. I'm like, what accent? What are you talking about? I don't have an accent. <clears throat> so uh, during the first few years of my medical practice, I gave people terrible nutrition advice. I told them things like you need to move more and eat less. You need to eat lots of complex carbohydrates, lots of whole grain breads. You need to drink a fruit smoothie every morning. Terrible advice like that. And so I have dedicated the remainder of my career as a family doctor to trying to undo the damage that I did in the first few years of my medical practice by giving terrible nutrition advice. And this is just one of the many ways that I am paying my penance, that I am seeking redemption from being a previous idiot, ignorant doctor who just gave the dumbest advice to people who were suffering from metabolic disease. <clears throat> so, See, Sheila thinks I have an accent too. Uh, Sheila, what accent? What are you talking about? I don't understand. All right, guys, let's do some questions and answers. I'm going to take the, uh, the majority of the questions from YouTube because there's so many people watching there. I'm going to grab some from Instagram and then maybe one or two from TikTok as well. Let's get started. Selby says, keto saved my life. Yeah, yours and tens if not hundreds of thousands of other people. Keto has saved their life. Carnivore has saved their life uh, or is in the process of doing so. So Julia says, Hubby and I are trying to get back on track. We're getting confused between a proper human diet and protein sparing modified fast. So for all you guys listening, a protein sparing modified fast is a potential tool that you might use short term if you are severely, severely obese and your, your weight loss has been stalled for many months. Otherwise, I don't recommend protein sparing modified fasting at all. Okay. You're going to get the vast majority of the benefits from eating a proper human diet and doing some degree of intermittent fasting uh, with your proper human diet. Gemini says, I know we should count calories and count protein. So Gemini, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with you. There is absolutely no need whatsoever to count calories if you're eating a proper human diet. There's also no way that you can actually count calories. Uh, let's, let's go into this because many, many people are, are confused about the calorie issue. So first of all, let's say you're going to count calories in the food you eat, okay? So you pick up an avocado. How many calories are in that avocado? You, Jim, and I have absolutely no idea. You can get a guesstimate, plus or minus 20%, by looking it up in one of the many databases online that says, oh, the average size avocado has a, approximately this many calories. Well, is that how many calories your avocado has? Definitely not. It's not. Your avocado might have 20% fewer or 20% more calories than what the number was that you looked up in the database. So that's number one. You never, ever can calculate the actual amount of calories in the food that you're about to eat. That's problem number one with calories.
calories. Problem number two with calories is figuring out how many calories you need every day. You can also go to a database and put in your height, your weight, your gender, your age, your body frame, and they'll give you a number, right? You put in your activity level and they'll say, oh, this is approximately the number of calories you need a day. Well, is that is that the actual number of calories that you personally need a day at your age, your weight, your height, your activity level, your hormone status? No, that's an, that is an approximation. So once again, you've got plus or minus 20%. Well, how many calories? So that's, that's number two. Number three is how many calories do you burn a day? Well, you can go to the database and put in all your identifying information, and it'll give you a number of the approximate number of calories you burn a day. Now, how accurate is that number? Guess what? It's plus or minus 20%. So when you, when you multiply the plus or minus 20% from the food you eat uh, to the plus or minus of calories you need a day to the plus or minus of calories you burn a day, your, your margin of error is huge. So you literally can never calculate and never know the number of calories you're about to eat. It is an unknowable number. The number of calories you need every day is an unknowable number. You can never know that number. You can get close to knowing it, plus or minus. Maybe if you really, really worked hard at it, you could get plus or minus 10%. That's as close as you can ever get. So no, Gemini, you don't need to count calories at all. Uh, Gemini says, I want to weigh 125 pounds. I'm five foot two inches. To get my protein goal, is it okay to go over 2,000 calories? Been keto a year next month and lost 50 pounds. Yeah, beautiful, Gemini. So what you need to do is keep your carbohydrate intake very, very low. And any carbohydrates you do ingest need to be real, whole, one ingredient carbohydrates that come from Mother Nature. None of the carbohydrates you eat need to come from Kellogg's or Post or General Mills or Kraft Heinz. They need to come from real, one ingredient foods like broccoli, asparagus, blueberries, cashews. All those things have carbohydrates. That's where you need to get them from if you're going to eat any carbohydrates at all. And so you need to, uh, you can figure up roughly how many calories you need a day, but again, that's going to be plus or minus 20%. So what I would recommend you do is um, eat lots of healthy fat and lots of healthy protein until you're comfortably stuffed and then stop eating and don't eat again until you are truly hungry. I think that is something that everybody can do uh, and, and then you're not doing a lot of busy work calculating the calories in your food, which is an unknowable number. You're just basically, you're making up a number and pretending that that's the number of calories you eat a day because it ain't. You can't calculate that number. The only way you could know how many calories are truly in the food you're about to eat is if you sent all the food you're about to eat off to a lab and they used a bomb calorimeter and burned that food up. And they would send you a printout and say, this is how many calories that was in the food you were about to eat. But the problem now becomes is you didn't get to eat the food. You're going to have to find another avocado and another ribeye and, and some more blueberries and cashews. And they will have a different calorie count. Also, all the calorie counters uh, count each gram of protein is four calories. And that's not how the human body uses protein at all. So this is problem number four with counting calories. The calories from protein don't count, okay? Some fats are actually not nine calories per gram. They're a little more or a little less. Did you know that? It's not set in stone that a gram of fat gives you nine calories. What about carbohydrates? Do some sugars give you slightly more or slightly less calories per gram? Yes. So the four, the four calories per gram for carbs, that's a fake number. It's not a real number. Same goes for protein. Some proteins will wind up giving you one and a half calories per gram because you're using the protein to build stuff with in your body. Same, same goes for fat. Not all fat that you eat is burned up as fuel. Some of it is used to build your cell membranes, your myelin sheath, new neurons, many, many other things. And so it only counts as calories if you burn it for energy. 
the vast majority of protein you eat, you don't burn that for energy. So therefore, how, why are you counting the calories? It's it's just it's foolishness to count the calories. And I know, Jim and I, you didn't know that, but now you do, don't you? And now the next time somebody says, how many calories you eat in a day? So you're going to say it is an unknowable number, as is the amount of calories that you eat a day. It is un, incalculable. Al M says, can you speak on your, I guess, Patreon group? So I have I have a Patreon, a Patreon account, and there's a link down in the show notes. And, and I do four additional live Q&As in there. And instead of a thousand people watching, we have about a hundred people. And so I'm able to answer many more questions in much more detail. Um, if any of you guys also, you can direct message me your questions there on Patreon. If you're interested in that, if there's a link in the show notes. Thanks, Al. David Lee says, I've been ketovore for almost three years and am down 160 pounds. Any of you guys sitting there right now with severe obesity? David Lee did it. David Lee is not a, a rocket surgeon or a brain scientist. He's just a guy, just like you and just like me. He lost 160 pounds in three years. His blood pressure is back to normal. His sleep apnea is gone. So, yay. But I'm just now hearing about oxalates. What's the story with oxalates? Uh, so I've got a couple of videos on my YouTube channel about oxalates. Uh, it's, it, for some people, it doesn't matter. It se seemingly doesn't matter. For other people, oxalates are a big deal. I would say that with your health improvements, David Lee, probably oxalates are not a big deal for you. I have a YouTube video on my channel about high oxalate foods that you can watch and you, and then if you want to, you can eliminate all the high oxalate foods for a month or 90 days and see if it makes a difference. Uh, CW, C, C witty on TikTok says, what's an ideal hemoglobin A1C? So an ideal, uh, a normal A1C is under 5.7. Okay. But ideal, perfect A1C is actually lower than that because the research is very clear that hemoglobin A1C is a spectrum, and the lower you can get it, the metabolically healthier you are. Okay. McDonald Lonnie. Hey, she said, hey, Dr. Barry, wanted to tell you that the translator that you hired to dub your videos on Dr. Barry in Espanol did a great job. So if any of you guys have a T.O. E. Tia. Uh, o oh, uh, abuela, o oh, abuelo, o oh, hermano, or hermana. Sorry, my Spanish. Uh, I have a channel now on YouTube called Dr. Barry in Espanol, and it's actually I'm I'm paying someone to dub my videos, so it's not just captions. It is actually dubbed, so they can just sit and listen to the video, just like you guys do. And so, if you have a a friend or a family member who English is definitely their second language, a distant second, uh, but Spanish is their first language, then Dr. Barry in Espanol, I'm going to be posting a new video there. And it's, it's my old videos that have been dubbed in very easy to understand Spanish. Uh, we, we searched high and low to find a, a someone who is uh, very fluent in Spanish, is a native Spanish speaker. So Dr. Barry in Espanol, if you have anybody who might benefit from that. Good questions. Jennifer Reese says, what do you think about fasting in general? I think fasting in general is a very ancestrally appropriate practice that human beings have been practicing since before we were human beings. For millions of years, our ancestors have been fasting. And back then, they called it starving because if you didn't kill something today, then you didn't eat until tomorrow. And that's how our body learned over millions of years to use not eating, which is what fasting is. Our body actually learned to use that to heal and rejuvenate and re revigorate our cells and our mitochondria. And so I practice daily intermittent fasting every single day. I, I have a, somewhere between a two hour and a six hour feasting window where I'll eat all the food I'm going to eat for that day with some, and it depends on my family, social, travel, all that, somewhere between two hours a day and six hours a day, I eat all the food I'm going to eat for that day. 
And then for the other uh, 18 to 22 hours, I fast. I don't eat anything. I might sip on some black coffee or some unsweetened tea uh, or some sparkling water, but otherwise I don't eat food. And if, if you're listening to this going, there's no way I could ever do that. Trust me. I used to be the ultimate high carbohydrate grazer back when I was a severely obese pre-diabetic family doctor who weighed 297 pounds. I grazed or snacked. I would eat three or four full meals a day with one or two snacks in between each meal. Definitely a bedtime snack, big bedtime snack. Most people will consider my bedtime snack a meal back in the day. And so I have transitioned from somebody who was eating at least six, if not eight meals a day back when I was severely obese. I have transitioned to this person talking to you right now who eats one or two meals a day every single day of their life and is very happy about it. I was, uh, Nisha and I and, and Beckett, we have a, a photo session coming up with a, a good friend of ours who's a professional photographer. And Nisha wants to take the photos down by, by our creek, our, our, our stream, our creek, if you're from Michigan. And so I'm cleaning up down there. And it was, it was 2 p.m. And she went to come down to say hi. She said, have you not eaten yet? I'm like, nope. She said, are you not hungry? I said, no. So I still haven't. It's uh, 3.45 p.m. my time, and I still haven't eaten today, and I probably won't eat till 6 or 7 because I'm so keto-adapted now. Even as a carnivore, I'm so keto-adapted that I just don't get hungry. But when I do get hungry, I eat, and I eat like I mean it, and then I stop eating when I'm comfortably stuffed. And you can do that, too. It just takes a while to transition to that. I promise you can do that. Richard Falk says his doctor told him that fasting has damaged his body. So this is one of the ignorant things that doctors will say. And, and your doctor, Richard, means well. Good intentions, but just doesn't have a damn clue what he or she's talking about. Fasting doesn't harm any human. We are, we are very good at fasting. Even though it might suck when you first start it, it might not be fun. You're very good at it. Your body knows exactly what to do when you don't eat. Paul lost 41 pounds in 50 days. Dang, Paul, that's pretty impressive. All right. I don't know how to pronounce this. My wife and I just found out we're pregnant. Booyah. Our natural sweetener safe, such as Truvia and monk fruit, uh, also is limited amounts of coffee. Okay. So my wife, Nisha, who is a labor and delivery nurse and is uh, almost certified as a lactation consultant and is uh, going to get her certification as a doula. Um, she is very well versed in this. We, we've been digging deep into the research and there's not a shred of research on the planet that shows that two to three cups of coffee a day hurts a pregnant woman or hurts her fetus in any way whatsoever. So your wife can have two or three cups of coffee a day. It's completely fine. No research supports the recommendation that you should avoid coffee while pregnant. I would stick to, as far as sweeteners go, I would stick to naturally natural stevia, natural monk fruit extract. These things are very natural. Human beings have been, been eating them for thousands of years. What I would absolutely avoid are the artificial uh, chemical factory manufactured sweeteners like NutraSweet, Aspartame, Saccharin, uh, Splenda. These things are made in a chemical factory. Uh, the way they got FDA approved is highly suspicious. Uh, if you haven't read the story about how NutraSweet got its FDA approval, you should you should just Google that and read about that. It's very worrisome. Uh, but coffee is fine. Your wife uh, can eat all the the rare ribeye that she wants. She can eat uh, well-made sushi from a reputable restaurant. All that stuff is completely and totally fine. Okay, she can eat liver. She can eat liver every day if she wants it because it's good for pregnant women. It's not bad. It's not dangerous in any way. Good question. Thanks, Michael, for the super chat. Uh, City, City Mama 25 says, Hi, Dr. Barry. How to get off all sugars? I'm definitely a sugar addict. This is a, a, a vital question. So... Raise your hand right now if you know you're a sugar addict. 
and you notice I've, I've got my hand up. I'm 100% a sugar addict. It took me months to break my sugar addiction. And many people who are now very happily on the wagon when it comes to sugar, uh, they'll raise their hand very proudly. Yeah, I'll ha- put in the comments if you're a sugar addict right now. I want everybody who currently is a sugar addict to know they're not alone. This is very, very common. I'm a caffeine addict and I and I am a sugar addict, 100%. But you don't have to keep eating sugar or drinking sugar for the rest of your life just because you're a sugar addict. Just, just like many alcoholics, I have very good friends who are alcoholics and they'll readily admit that, but they haven't have a, they haven't drank a drop of alcohol in many, many years because they know they have a problem with alcohol. Yeah, look at all the look at all the comments, guys. Look at all the sugar addicts. It's totally fine. Don't be ashamed of that. Also, don't deny that sugar addiction is a real thing. The research is very clear that sugar can be abused by all mammals. Sugar is addictive, especially in large bursts that come intermittently right? And so if you, you know, you don't eat sugar all day, but then all of a sudden you eat an entire Sara Lee coffee cake, which I used to do routinely. When you eat that huge spike of sugar like that, it leads to addiction. Okay. There's the research is very clear about this, but there are many large food corporations like Kellogg's and Pepsi Cola, Coca-Cola, Mondelez, who will they'll pay researchers to say, well, it's debatable whether sugar is really addictive or not in humans. Every other mammal we've ever studied, we can get them completely and thoroughly addicted to sugar. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we can get we can get rodents, rats and mice. We can get them so addicted to sugar that when you give them naloxone, which is something we would give somebody if they had if they had overdosed on morphine or oxycontin. When you give the rats or mice naloxone, they literally have withdrawal symptoms and all they've been uh, consuming is sugar water. But they withdraw from the sugar water. So you, when it comes to th- the way that brainstem works and the nucleus accumbens, it's the same in humans as it is in all mammals. And so to say that, that ad- sugar is not addictive to humans is foolishness. Oki says, hey, Doc, I just got off the triple B&E challenge. That's beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. Oki did that for 30 days. I lost 28 pounds. But now trying to adjust to a regular carnivore diet, any suggestions? Just eat eat fatty meat and eggs with the yolk until you're comfortably stuffed, Oki, and then push away from the table and go have fun. That's all you got to do. It's just that simple. So Oki... If you don't know what the beef, butter, bacon, and eggs challenge is, I have a YouTube video about that. And in 28 days, in 30 days, he lost 28 pounds. And you're like, wait a minute, you can eat all the meat and eggs with the yolk that you can hold, as eat as many times a day as you want, and still lose fat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's not about the amount of calories, folks. It's about the number of carbohydrates you eat. And when you cut your carbohydrates down low enough, you're going to start burning fat because you are going to be in a physiological state that we call ketosis, which means you are burning your own stored body fat for fuel. Now, if you eat too many carbohydrates, you will turn off ketosis and you will not burn your body fat. You can calorie restrict, you can portion control, you can try to eat less and move more all you want to. But if your blood sugar level causes your insulin level to be too high, you're not going to burn fat. It's just that simple. It's a hormonal issue. It's not a calorie issue. Well done, Oki. Keep it up. Kim Sutton says, carnivore, what would you suggest for a cough or congestion? Just saw all the stuff uh, in all the cough drops, all the ingredients. Yeah, all cough drops and, and cough syrups on the market are crap, okay? What everyone needs to understand is that when a mammal gets sick with an upper respiratory infection, they cough. And it's good that they cough. Coughing is not a bad thing. Coughing is good for you. It helps you heal. It helps you fight the upper respiratory infection and heal sooner. 
You should not try to suppress your cough. You should embrace your cough and thank the creator that you have a cough because it will help you heal. About a month ago, Beckett caught some little upper respiratory thing as, as young kids are want to do. They're going to do that as they get around other kids because they're going to be exposed to things they've never been exposed to before. And he was mildly sick for a day or two or three. And then for the, for the last three weeks, he's had this cough. Very productive. And, and it's basically his body getting rid of the dead white blood cells, the dead virus, coughing all that stuff up, the dead epithelial cells. He's coughing all that stuff up. That's good. That's good that he's doing that. I, not, I have no desire to suppress his cough. Now, when we're out in public, we were at the zoo and he coughed and there was a mother. It's like, you know, she's just wanting to be helpful. She's like, oh my, that's a nasty cough. And Nisha and I both just smiled at her, said, thanks. That's not a nasty cough. That is a good, healthy, productive cough. He's healing. So, um, now, if you're in a social situation where you don't want to just cough right in someone's face, try to find a sugar-free cough lozenge that is as low carbohydrate as you can possibly find and use it very selectively in that social situation. Maybe if you're going to church, you don't want to disrupt the whole service, or you're going to a business meeting, or you're going to be on a Zoom call and you don't want to cough the entire time. Find something that's sugar-free and as low carb as possible and use it very judiciously. You don't need that. Coughing is a good thing. You want to cough until your lungs are healed. Then you'll stop coughing. Good question, Kim. Tammy Grigg says, failed Rowan Y, will carnivore still work? So Rowan Y is one of the, the bariatric surgeries. It's actually the most aggressive surgery. It's where they chop out a large portion of your stomach and a large uh, portion of your small intestine, and they throw it in the garbage. And... Uh, I don't recommend anyone get a row and Y, but if, if you've already gotten it, you can't take it back. You're stuck with it now. But, Tammy, you're still a human being, and you still need to eat a proper human diet. You need all of the, the amino acids, the fatty acids, the vitamins, and the minerals that occur naturally in a proper human diet. You need those things. And you may, since your gastrointestinal system, Tammy, has been mutilated permanently, you may have to take some supplements in addition to a proper human diet. It's not your fault, but it is now your lifelong problem, Tammy. And so I would highly recommend that every bite of food you eat is nutrient dense and that you eat only real, whole, one ingredient, ancestrally appropriate foods, Tammy. I wouldn't waste any stomach space, of which yours is very tiny. I wouldn't waste any stomach space whatsoever on any sugars at all, on any grains at all you know, on any vegetable seed oils whatsoever. Carnivore, Tammy, is probably the only way you'll ever be able to get the amount of nutrition you need without supplementing. And you may still need to supplement on top. Andy Plays Game says, Hey, Doc, any tips for me? Someone who finds something clean, ketovore carnivore, then eat it often until I get tired of it then eventually run out of things to eat and go back to dirty keto or barely keto. So Andy, you're still, you're, I think you've got two things going on in your brain that you need to work on. Number one is, is that the foods you eat each day should be a major pleasure of your day. And for any of you guys listening to this, if, if, if eating is the biggest pleasure you get out of your day on average, you got a problem. You're either a sugar addict or you need to really, really work on the other areas of your life because your, your family, your friends, self-improvement, projects, goals, those are the things that should give you the majority of pleasure each day in your life. And if, if you're like, well, no, actually, that, that um, toaster strudel that I smashed this morning for breakfast, that definitely was the highlight of my day. That's a problem. And it's not an unsolvable problem, but it is a problem currently that you need to face and you need to deal with, or otherwise life is not going to get better for you as time goes on, okay? That's that's number one. And number two, Andy, is that you've got to understand that eating, is that's how you get nutrition. That is the goal. That is the purpose. Oh, my, my 
hot pregnant wife just was inappropriate with me. I love it when she does that. That's what you get. I'll tell on you. <laughs> so you eat for nutrition and it's okay to enjoy your food. I, I enjoy it. I've got a, a tomahawk ribeye waiting for me when I break my fast. I'm going to enjoy that. I'm going to smash that ribeye, but that's not going to be the highlight of my day. I'm going to eat that for nutrition and I'm going to enjoy the nutrition that's in that, in the flavors and the salt and the spices. But the, the, the highlight of my day is my, my children and my wife and the book I'm writing and the, the farm that I'm trying to transform and the plans that I have for all my family for the future. That's, that's what gives me my pleasure each day. I eat food for nutrition and I encourage you to do that too. And also Andy, some degree of sugar addiction is probably in there. If you find yourself in a cycle of, man, I'm eating really clean keto, ketovore, carnivore. And then well, I'm, I'm tired of that. I'm going to go back to dirty, lazy keto, which basically means eating lots of keto cookies, cakes, pies, protein bars, keto shakes. That's probably sugar addiction, Andy. And, and, and you're, you're currently not calling it what it is, but that's probably what it is. So think about those things. And, and I think you'll, you'll come to realize, Hmm, I've got a problem and that's the bad news. But the good news is Andy, you can fix it. You can fix it. And you can fix it permanently and you can be a sugar holic in recovery and you can eat for nutrition and then live your life for pleasure. But food should not be your biggest pleasure. Great questions, guys. Let's get one from TikTok. Best keto carnivore foods for someone on a really tight budget. That's a TikTok question. That's a great question. Let's talk about that. I actually have a YouTube video called Cheap Keto. If you just if you go to YouTube and search Dr. Barry Cheap Keto, you'll find that video and you can watch it. But basically, if you find a bologna, a bologna, as we say here in Tennessee, or hot dogs, or potted meat, or, or deli meat, find the lowest carbohydrate option that you can afford. You can buy ground beef, the 70-30 ground beef in the big five-pound stick. Or you can find ground beef on sale and buy 10 pounds of it and put it in your freezer. Basically, the only thing you need to have in your freezer is meat, frozen meat that you found on sale. You need to throw it, go to, into your freezer as soon as this live is over. If you've got any frozen crap in your freezer, throw it away. You need that freezer space because you're going to start watching the sales. And when you find ground beef or hot dogs or, or whatever, uh, stew meat on sale, you're going to buy 10 pounds of it and you're going to freeze it and put it in, the, uh, in your freezer and that's, that's how you're going to save money and still be able to eat keto, ketovore, carnivore, okay? And keep in mind, everybody who's watching this, you may not know this, but carnivore is a subset of keto. So keto is less than 20 to 50 total grams of carbs a day. That's what keto is, okay? For most people, you can be in good ketosis if you're eating somewhere between 20 and 50 total grams of carbohydrates a day. Ketovore is 10 total grams of carbs a day. You see, it's still within keto, but it's it's a smaller circle. It's ketovore. And then if you just eat animal-based foods, that's carnivore. Carnivore is still keto, and you're still going to be in ketosis for the vast majority of the day. Does that make sense? And so regardless, if you're trying to eat keto on a budget, ketovore on a budget, or carnivore on a budget, it's all going to hinge on buying the cheapest meat that you can buy on sale. You can buy 10 pounds of chicken thighs or chicken legs and get them very cheaply. You can buy chicken livers or beef liver or pork liver very, very cheaply. If you talk to the, the meat manager at your supermarket and say, hey, I'm looking for cheap cuts of meat, okay? Okay. That's how you're going to have to do this. So whether it's keto, ketovore, or carnivore, it all hinges around you eating lots of fatty meat and lots of eggs with the yolk. And you're going to buy, find those things on sale and you're going to buy them in quantity and you're going to freeze them. So I'm going to, when I come to your house, the only thing in your freezer, there better not be any popsicles. There better not be any toaster strudel. There better not be any lean cuisine or we can't be friends. 
your freezer needs to be filled up with meat, fatty meat that you got on sale. That's the only thing a freezer's for in your kitchen. Good question. Samuel says, hello, Doc. I can I can add sodium tablets if I can't get enough food. What kind do you recommend? Um, I don't recommend any sodium tablets, Samuel. I recommend you salting your food to taste, but you need to eat food for nutrition. Salt has sodium and chloride, and maybe if you get the right kind of salt, like Redmond's, you might get some trace minerals. But just adding salt tablets to your that diet, that's not going to give you any meaningful nutrition at all. You need to eat real, ancestrally appropriate human food and salt that food to taste. Body blow biscuit butter. What a handle. Elevated liver enzymes. Doctor says it's due to high cholesterol. Yeah, your doctor's wrong. Uh, not the, the Crestor. So what are the odds that it's actually the cholesterol medicine that's elevating your liver enzymes versus just having high cholesterol? About 100% chance that it's the Crestor. Now, if you're still eating too many carbohydrates, you might also have high triglycerides from eating too many carbohydrates, especially if they're highly processed carbohydrates, but you're not... Having high cholesterol does not elevate your liver enzymes. That's that that your doctor basically revealed a complete lack of understanding of human physiology when he or she said that. Uh, had an ultrasound, no fatty liver, and that's good. Okay, what about alcohol? Body blow biscuit butter. Are you drinking alcohol because that can raise your liver enzymes? Are you taking too much ibuprofen or acetaminophen or Tylenol or Advil because that can raise your liver enzymes? Did you used to drink lots of alcohol, because that can cause you to have high liver enzymes. Uh, can high total cholesterol cause elevated enzymes? No, but high triglycerides can. And if you still have high triglycerides, that means you need to lower your total carbohydrate intake each day, and you'll fix that. Angelic Annihilator says, do you think I should replace my root canal with an implant? I think Yes, I think I, I do not like root canals. They make me very nervous. I'm not a dentist, uh, but I have read quite a, quite a bit about root canals. Basically, you're killing the tooth and then leaving the dead tooth in your gum. That would be like if I if I cut off the blood supply to my hand and cut off the nerve supply, just kill my hand, and it was just a, a black shriveled up little nub but I didn't cut the hand off. I left it there. My little black nub. Do you see how, how could I not have a smoldering infection? Indeed, any surgeon, if you, if you lose, if you, if you damage a foot to the point where it's like, we can't save this foot. Do they just kill the blood supply and the nerves and let the little black nub hang there? No, no surgeon would do that. They would lose their license. But that's effectively what a root canal is. They kill the blood supply and the nerve supply and then let the dead tooth stay in your head. Mm -mm. I would I would have that removed and, and, and then I would consider an implant. If it was a front tooth, then yeah, you need an implant because people are going to make fun of you if you've got a front tooth missing. That's just human nature. We can't help it. We're all kids at heart. But if it's a back tooth, I would consider just leaving it, leaving the empty space. I think that's probably the healthiest option. But if you're going to get an implant, make sure that they're using things that don't cause inflammation in your body. Yeah, a standard dentist will tell you that a root canal is fine, and standard dentists get paid very well to do root canals. That's one of their highest paying procedures. But as a, as a doctor, as a, an animal biologist, as a relative expert on human physiology and the, the human immune system, I would not recommend you keep any dead part of your body attached to your body. If you if if you have a, a finger that you lose blood supply to and it dies, I would recommend you have that removed immediately. There's a thing called gangrene, right? So yeah, I'm not a big fan of root canals. Oh, Scott says, what's your opinion of teenagers drinking muscle milk? I think muscle milk for any human being, except for someone who is a competitive bodybuilder or power lifter, is a complete and utter waste of money and probably contributes to metabolic disease. 
maybe if your teenager is is competing for the the junior Mr. Olympia or Miss Olympia, or is competing for a uh, level one collegiate athletic career, they might benefit from muscle milk. But if you're talking about just a normal teenager who works out a little, plays a little ball, is active, then it's a complete and utter waste of money and probably contributes to metabolic disease. That goes for all adults as well. Thank you, Kathy, for the super chat. Uh, let's see. Let's get a question from Instagram. Leanne Fanny says, should I count calories if I'm not losing weight after six months? No, Leanne Fanny, you should watch my YouTube video called The 13 Reasons Why Weight Loss Might Stall and investigate all 13 of those reasons. Um, I doubt that you're eating low carb enough, Leanne, but also you, you have to consider, do you have an undiagnosed low thyroid condition? Do you have an undiagnosed adrenal condition? Do you have an undiagnosed sex hormone condition? It depends on your gender. It depends on your age. It depends on your current metabolic status. It depends on a great many things, Leanne Fanny. Love the handle, by the way. Uh, but uh, counting calories is not going to help you in any meaningful way. And I've got several videos on my YouTube channel about why counting calories is dumb. It's never going to help you achieve any health goal ever. Thanks, Kathy, for the super chat. Harmless Rebel says, eight weeks carnivore, still getting chest gas and burping a lot. Stomach issues and tailpipe gas are gone. Do I just need more time or is this normal? Uh, so Harmless Rebel has noticed on after eight weeks of carnivore that um, they have much less in the way of flatulence from the back door. So that's farts. And that's, this is very common. Almost every carnivore notices that they just don't fart like they used to after a few weeks of a carnivore diet. And it's because your gut bacteria have calmed down and all the gas forming bacteria that are typically carb or sugar lovers have been downgraded and you've upgraded all of the protein and fat loving bacteria and they don't make a lot of gas. Also, you've decreased your fiber intake and in that again, once again, you're going to have much less gas when you do that. The fact that you're still burping a lot means that you're probably swallowing air when you eat or drink because there are no bacteria in your stomach that make gas. They, they don't start occurring until much further down your digestive system. Typically, uh, the, always in the colon, but sometimes in the ileum as well. But if you're burping, you're swallowing, you're swallowing air, either with your food or with your drinks, or if you're drinking lots of carbonated uh, sparkling water, that'll make you burp as well. But there are no gas forming bacteria in the human stomach. Good question. Keith says, do you need carbs to make progress with strength training? It's a good question. I get this a lot. So, Keith, if you are a collegiate, a level one collegiate athlete, if you're playing for the University of Notre Dame or the University of Tennessee or UCLA, that's a you may need some carbs when you're training. OK, if you're training for Mr. Olympia, if you're training to be a powerlifting champion, I'm talking about collegiate or above. You might need some carbohydrates, but for every weekend warrior, everybody trying to build some muscle in the gym, everybody trying to, to become a 5K athlete at a local or even a regional level, there is no need for carbohydrates whatsoever. None. None. Okay. We see multiple examples in the ethnographic literature, in the anthropological literature of entire societies that eat essentially zero carb and they are very athletic. They're excellent hunters. And back in the day, 50,000 years ago, that that's what a good athlete did was they hunted. Back then, if, if you said to the other members of the tribe, Hey, you, you want to go jog five miles? They would have probably kicked you out of the tribe because that's, dumb. But if you wanted to go and train to be a better hunter, they, they would join you and they would think that was very wise. 
So no, if you're anything less than a level one collegiate athlete, you never need carbohydrates to get stronger bones or stronger muscles. It is unnecessary. Good question. Tadios, thanks for the super chat, my friend. <clears throat> Sean says, after three months of carnivore, I've lost 40 pounds. There's that pattern again. I go carnivore, I lose fat. But my blood pressure has changed very little. It's still in the high 170s, over 100s. Also, uh, recommend stevia when, from what I hear, it spikes your insulin higher than table sugar. For most people, stevia doesn't spike your insulin nearly as high as table sugar will. S some of us, however, I think it still causes a substantial insulin elevation. Um, some uh, At this point, Sean, go talk to your doctor and say, doctor, are you sure that I don't have a secondary cause of hi hypertension? Because at this point, if, you, if you've been three months carnivore and you lost 40 pounds and your blood pressure still in the 170s over hundreds, you have secondary hypertension until proven otherwise. And there's a list of conditions. You can just Google secondary hypertension causes and, and you'll know as much as your doctor. And you can write those causes down and then go back and see your doctor and say, doctor, are you sure I don't have one of these causes of secondary hypertension? And your doctor will First of all, look at you and be like, who the hell are you? How do you know even what that is? But then your doctor will actually investigate secondary causes of hypertension. And in your case, Sean, probably find one and correct it. And then there you go. You just fix that problem. Virtually everyone after three months of carnivore, they, their blood pressure may be still a little bit high, but it's going to be much better than it was before they went carnivore. This is This happens without exception. Yoga says, hey, Dr. Barry, I just signed up uh, to your Patreon and wanted to thank you because your videos have helped me to redesign my diet. And I've lost 30 pounds since the start of the year. So 30 pounds in four and a half months. There's that pattern again. Uh, I'm five foot five inches tall and was 230 pounds. Good morning from Sydney, Australia. Thanks for the super chat, Yoga. I love that you're, you're transforming your health by eating a proper human diet. Now your job yoga is to start to teach your friends and your family how to do this. Uh, all of you guys watching this, you do not have to be a doctor to teach your friends and family how to eat a proper human diet. You do not have to be a dietitian. You do not have to be a nutritionist. You, step one, fix your own metabolic health. And yoga's doing that. He's right in the middle of that. He's figured it out. He, he understands a proper human diet now. And now it's time for him to start teaching the people in his life that he loves who are metabolically unwell, because very often their doctor and their dietitian is giving them exactly the wrong advice. Well done, yoga. Well done. Thanks for the super chat. Orgo Kodras. Is that right? Orgo. Hey, Doc, I've been on keto for a few months as well as fasting uh, 20 slash four. Now, when you see that, that means he fasts for 20 hours a day and then has a four hour feasting window. And he's on keto. I've lost 25 pounds and feel great. There's that pattern again. However, my lab results show triglycerides at 233 and LDL cholesterol at 188. So, uh, Horgo, your triglycerides are still high. First of all, you have to be fasting to get your triglycerides checked. You need to fast for 12 to 14 hours before a triglyceride check. So if you weren't fasting, that could explain it. Uh, the second explanation is that your keto that you've currently been doing, although it's helping you, is still too high in carbohydrates for you personally. Does that make sense? So if you've been doing... 30, 40, 50 total grams of carbohydrates a day, Kodras, then you're going to cut that in half. If you're keto, you're going to go ketovore. If you're ketovore, you're going to go carnivore. And that's going to get your triglycerides down to normal. Now, your LDL being high, I have multiple videos on this channel. And my good friend, Dr. David Diamond, who's a PhD researcher at the University of South Florida, he spent his entire career studying human lipidology, which is the study of cholesterol 
and triglycerides. And he will tell you very quickly that having an LDL of 188 is not dangerous at all. It's not bad at all. You don't need a statin for that. My tri, uh, triglycerides last time I checked them were about 55. My LDL cholesterol last time I checked it was about 250. And I do not take a statin. I will not take a statin because I don't believe that having high LDL cholesterol in the face of having a normal HDL and normal triglycerides and a normal hemoglobin A1C and a normal C peptide, I don't believe having, having a high LDL cholesterol in that context is unhealthy or dangerous in any way. But uh, keep doing your research and keep learning and keep, uh, keep improving your health. It sounds like you probably need to either fast before you have your triglycerides checked or cut the carbs a little bit more. Good question. Flower Bomb 90 says, how can an Asian woman, 170 pounds, eating good food like rice, fruits, potatoes, get diabetes, while a 300-pound American male eating a sad diet is not diabetic? This is an excellent question. I, I try to talk about this, but I don't talk about it enough. So your DNA matters a lot when it comes to if you overeat carbohydrates, are you going to become diabetic yet still stay relatively slender? Or are you going to get fat as a house, but yet not develop diabetes? Now, on average, people of Asian descent and of Indian descent, they, they, they can eat tons of carbs. And she said good food in quotation marks because she knows rice and fruits and potatoes are not good foods. They're great if you're starving to death. They'll keep you from starving. But if what you're trying to do is optimize your health, they're not good foods. But Asian people eat these foods every day, and if you just look at them, they look relatively slender. They might have a little bit of a belly pooch, but they're not severely obese. But if you check their hemoglobin A1C and their C-peptide, they often have severe metabolic disease, often severe prediabetes or type 2 diabetes and hyperinsulinemia, but they're still relatively slender. But if you take a white guy like me, I'll get big as a house if you feed me too many carbs. I'll be I'll be 297 pounds, but still only be just a little bit pre-diabetic. And there are, in fact, many Caucasian people, uh, depending on their, their DNA, their ancestry, their genetics, they'll get four, five, six, seven hundred pounds, but still not be a type two diabetic. But now many doctors don't know to check their C-peptide or their fasting insulin. So these people are, are in fact, severely hyperinsulinemic. But uh, it's called a personal fat threshold. And I've talked about this in multiple videos, but this may be the first time you're hearing it. Some of us, depending on our, our heritage, our DNA, we will fatten very easily, but not develop type 2 diabetes very easily. Others of us... It's very hard for us to get fat, but we develop type 2 diabetes very, very easily. And it's, it's the difference in the DNA flower bomb. Asian women can eat tons of carbs and still not be fat, but they can be severely, have severe metabolic syndrome. And then there are some uh, people with lighter skin uh, from more northern DNA who can get 700 pounds and still not be a type 2 diabetic. That happens. That's a real thing. Sharon says, I have Hashimoto's and I'm on meds for that, but not dropping pounds at all, not losing fat. Uh, is my liver not converting T4 to T3? Well, it may be, Sharon. And so the way to know is to, is to get a reverse T3 checked. Also have your TPO antibody and your TG antibody checked, along with your TSH and your free T3 and free T4. Then you'll know if you have a conversion problem, You'll also know if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis or one of the other thyroiditis. Uh, that's one of many things that, uh, and then also you may be not, you may not be taking enough thyroid replacement hormone. Many doctors don't give you enough. Uh, my hub said my calories might be too low. Help. So yeah, you need a full thyroid panel. And I've, I've talked about that in several thyroid videos uh, and so go, just go to YouTube and search Dr. Barry thyroid and you'll find all my thyroid videos. And in most of those videos, I'll tell you the full thyroid panel that you need to ask for. Okay. Probably has nothing to do with your calories. Now, Sharon, you may not be eating enough food because it's very common for women when they're trying to lose weight. Some men too, but usually women, 
they'll portion control and they'll try to cut back on how much food they eat. But the beauty of a proper human diet is, is if you're eating lots of healthy fats and lots of healthy proteins in the way of fatty meat and eggs with the yolk, you can eat until you're comfortably stuffed. And that actually tells your body, it tells your hormones that there's not a famine. There's plenty of food. So your body will actually raise your metabolic rate, which is the rate that you burn fat. And indeed, many people, when they start a carnivore diet, they get something called the meat sweats and they feel hot. They're like, I'm hot all the time. I had to turn down the air conditioner. That's evidence that you actually increased your metabolic rate. You've increased the, the rate that you're burning fat. Okay. And that doesn't work when you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, but it does work when you're eating a diet that's full of healthy fats and healthy proteins and eating until you're comfortably stuffed. Good question, Sharon. IKO4 says, after five weeks of strict carnivore, my weight loss has slowed and I've only lost one pound in the last week. I'm a 200 pound white male. Uh, ideal body weight's around 180. So uh, IKO, IKO4 and many others of you are probably figuring out that the last 20 pounds are the slowest to go. This is very common when you're losing weight. As you start to approach your ideal body weight, you're weight loss is going to slow down. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It doesn't mean that you need to change anything. You just need to give your body time. The last 20 pounds, as any woman will tell you, or any man who's tried to lose a lot of weight in the past, the last 20 pounds are the hardest. The first 20, that's pretty easy, especially if you're on a proper human diet. But the last 20, your body, your body is going to slow down the weight loss as you approach your ideal body weight. That, this is just how the human physiology works. Hey, thanks for sharing this video. Uh, any of you guys, if you think this video, if I've covered a topic, you're like, you know, my, my family member, my friend, they would really, they need to hear that. Then click the share button right now and you can send it to them in a direct message or you can share it on your favorite social media and tag them in it. The more you share this video, the more people that I'm able to reach and the more people that I'm able to help. You can help me help others by sharing this video 100%. Neats B says, hey, Dr. B, will triple B and E help with trigger fingers? So triple B and E, if you guys are seeing that abbreviation in the comments, that stands for beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. And so if you have a trigger finger, which looks like that when it gets severe enough, you're probably, you're not going to reverse that by eating a proper human diet. You're going to probably have to have that surgically corrected. But do you know the, the, the percentage of the time that getting a trigger finger released, that it actually goes back down again? It's, it's a very high recurrence rate. But if you're eating a proper human diet after you get it surgically fixed, then the odds of it staying fixed go way up. Okay. M. Webb says, hit the thumbs up button. Do not forget. I'm going to pin that one. That's a good one. I like that comment. You guys all hit the thumb. Preferably this one. Carrie says she hit the thumb button 13 trillion billion times. Dang, you've been busy. You've been busy. All right. Let's get a... Melinda says, what about a DHEA supplement? Do we need to take that? So it depends on your age. It depends on what your current DHEA sulfate level is. You might need a DHEA sulfate supplement, or you might not. So your doctor can actually check that. So next time you go, if you think your DHEA may be low, ask your doctor to check it. And if it is low, then uh, eating a proper human diet is going to improve it. It's going to help to at least some degree. But some folks, usually after the age of 50, 60, 70 years of age, they need to take a DHEA supplement. Carnivore Gina says, can you go over the butter coffee rule on carnivore? So the only reason to put fat in your coffee is to try to extend your fast, okay? The, most people put some kind of high carbohydrate junk in their coffee, like carnation whatever mocha that's basically pure sugar and, and vegetable seed oil 
right? So I don't recommend that at all. If you're not hungry, then you need to just, if you're, if you're thirsty, then drink some regular water, sparkling water, black coffee, or unsweet tea. Now, if you're trying to fast for longer, but you're starting to get hungry and you're like, man, I'm going to have to eat. Then what you can do is put some pure fat in your coffee. So a, a teaspoon of butter, that's my favorite. I love butter in my coffee. Or you can put some MCT oil if you like that sort of thing. I don't ever do that. Uh, heavy cream is not bad, but don't get carried away with the heavy cream. What you're going to do is that fat. <clears throat> also, you can put some salt in your coffee or take a pinch of salt and put on your tongue. That's an excellent way to turn off your hunger so you can fast for longer. And so it's perfectly fine uh, to put a little pat of butter in your coffee. It's really tasty too. Or put a pinch of salt in your coffee if you're starting to get hungry. But if you're not hungry, then that doesn't serve any magical purpose whatsoever. A lot of people, when they start keto, they think, oh, I, I must put MCT oil in my coffee or I'm not doing keto right. It's not true at all. You don't have to do that. For many of you guys, that's a complete and utter waste of money. Okay. Okay. If you're not hungry, just drink liquids if you're thirsty. If you're not thirsty, you don't even have to drink liquids. But if you get thirsty, then drink. But if you start to get hungry and you're like, man, I don't want to break my fast for another two hours, then you're going to put a pinch of salt on your tongue or in what you're drinking, or you're going to put a little pat of butter. Because when you put carbs in your liquid, that's going to spike your insulin and you're going to break your fast. Even if you put protein in your coffee, like a protein powder or an amino acid powder, that's going to that's gonna raise your insulin enough to break your fast. But when you put pure fat in your coffee, fat only raises your insulin a tiny amount, and it's not enough to really break the physiological fast that we're going for. And that's why it's okay to do that if you're starting to get hungry. Make sense? Thanks for the badges on Instagram, you guys. And thanks for the, the roses. Is that what I'm getting over here on TikTok? Some kind of flower or some kind of jewel or something. I don't know. All right. Mr. Vegas says, does diet soda mess up your thirst signals? Should we stop drinking it? I rephrase that, Mr. Vegas. Maybe, maybe. Uh, for many of us, especially those of us who are, are sugar addicts, raise your hand if you're a sugar addict. Type in the comments right now. I'm a sugar addict. If you are one of those, then you probably need to get all the artificial sweeteners out of your mouth for at least 90 days so you can so you can take control of your sugar addiction. And for many of us, I think we're drinking uh, diet soda for the for the taste. We're not drinking it because we're truly thirsty. And if you're doing that, if you're sipping on diet soda or diet a diet soft drink just mindlessly because it tastes good, that's a problem. <clears throat> yeah, that's not healthy. You're basically, even if it's not unhealthy, think about this. Even if it's not unhealthy to drink three uh, 20 ounce Diet Cokes a day, do you really want to spend that much money every day supporting the mission of the Coca Cola multinational corporation? Is that really what you want to spend your money on? I tend to want to vote with my dollars. I want to vote for local ranchers who are raising cows and sheep and goats. I want to vote for local farmers who are raising chickens and eggs and, and geese and ducks. I want to vote for local gardeners who are raising organic broccoli and asparagus, and other vegetables. That's, that's who I want to, because every time you spend money, you're voting. With your American dollars, your Canadian dollars, your Australian dollars, you're, you're voting. And is Coca-Cola or Pepsi, is that really who you want to vote for? Do you really think they have your best interest at heart? Or are you drinking their diet soft drink because you're a sugar addict and maybe a caffeine addict as well? And that artificial sweetener tweaks your little sugar habit just right, that even though it's not sugar, it still gives you that little buzz and that little pleasant feeling. I'm sick and tired of, 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 of sending my money to the multinational corporations, all of them. They need to work just like the rest of us. <clears throat> the days are over when we should just blindly, thoughtlessly 
give Coca-Cola or Pepsi or Mondelez or Kellogg's. Oh, here's three bucks a day of my money that I work for. Here you go. Take it. Your product is either bad for me or has no beneficial effect for me whatsoever, but you can still have three of my bucks every day. Think about that. Think that through. Really? You could be voting with that three bucks with a local rancher or a local gardener trying to, to, to encourage your local economy because I feel like we really all should be doing that with the way things are going at the national level and the global level. Uh, but you want to you want to give Coca Cola or Pepsi three bucks a day? Come on. Tomek says no vegan agenda. Sincere research is taking animal life okay when a vegan diet is sustainable, or is is vegan unsustainable? There are long term vegans. Yes, there are. <clears throat> but if you look at any long term vegan Tomek, and I get your point, I'm I am not. I'm not one of the vegan attackers in the carnivore community, in the keto keto community. I'm not a, I don't attack vegans. I think that vegans have taken the first step towards better health by actually thinking about the food they put in their mouth. I think that's an excellent first step. And I applaud every vegan who's taken that first step. And I think that when you convert from the standard American highly processed junk diet, when you convert from that to a vegan diet, I think that you're going to have health markers that improve 100%. The problem with a vegan diet, an exclusively plant-based diet, is that you are you're, you have two choices as months and years go by. You're either going to have to take a handful of supplements every day, or you will definitely develop vitamin and mineral deficiencies. All of the, the, the reputable vegan influencers like Dr. Greger, Dr. Neil Bernard. Um, I'm, I'm just in the middle of, of reading this book right now by T. Colin Campbell. I'm, I'm, I'm not a vegan hater. I love it that people are going, you know, maybe the food I eat, maybe that matters for my health and maybe for the world. I love that people are having that conversation. That conversation is, that's a real conversation. That's a, that is evidence of somebody who's trying to use their head for something besides a hat rack. I'm glad you're having that conversation. Even if your current solution is vegan, I'm fine with that. I, I want you to read everything T. Colin Campbell has ever written because I've read probably four of his books so far, and I agree with a lot of the stuff he says. Not everything, but T. T. Colin and I, we agree about a great many things. So I want you to be thinking about the food you put in your mouth. How does it affect my health? How does it affect the planet? And the problem with a vegan diet, unless you're growing your own vegetables at home, is that a large percentage of your diet is going to have to come from grains. Because broccoli and asparagus and Brussels sprouts and, and all the greens, they're not shelf stable. You can't put them on a ship grow them in China, put them on a ship and ship them to America and then put them in a warehouse for a month and then put them on the grocery store for a month. That doesn't work with real vegetables. And so if your vegan diet includes lots of grains and lots of, lots of vegetable seed oils, you're going to have inflammation in your body. You're going to have hyperinsulinemia. And unless you take a handful of supplements every day, and Dr. Greger does a great job of telling you all the supplements you're going to need as a vegan. You're going to develop vitamin and mineral and omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies. It is going to happen. If you're okay with that and you're, and, and you're confident that your supply of supplements is never going to get cut off by some catastrophe, either natural or man-made or some war, and all of a sudden you go to the store and they're like, yeah, we're out of your B12. We don't have, I don't know when we're going to get any more. Right. And if you're okay with millions of acres of, of land being monocropped in wheat, rice, oats, and corn and chemicals sprayed on that, because you can't monocrop like that without, without the, the, para, the parasites and the bugs and the worms and the, and the rodents just eating that up. That's, you can't, you cannot monocrop a thousand acres of wheat or soybean 
or rice or oats or corn. You can't do that without putting tons of chemicals on the dirt. And what you're doing is you're turning soil, which is a very rich commodity, you're turning soil into dirt when you do that. When you put artificial fertilizers on the soil, you're killing the soil. You're killing the microbes. When you put glyphosate and the other pesticides and herbicides on the soil, you're killing billions of living things in the soil. When you monocrop huge areas of land like that, you're destroying habitat for all the ground dwelling birds like quail. When I was a kid, you could walk through any pasture and there would be quail fly up everywhere. Now you can drive for miles and not see any quail because all, all every field is full of soybeans and corn. That's not okay. You're not helping the earth be a healthier place if you're not encouraging birds and, and small mammals. If you're, if you're destroying their habitat, that's not okay. If, if your grains come to your table because of the, the, the greenhouse emitting gasoline that was put in the tractor and then in the combine and then in the truck and then in the, the ship that went over the ocean, how are you helping the earth be healthier? I don't think you are. If you are eating a diet that is by definition deficient in vitamins and minerals and omega-3 fatty acids, how is that a proper human diet? How is that healthy? What are you going to do if the factory that's making your handful of supplements that you have to take every day on a vegan diet, what are you going to do if that factory closes? Or if, if the, the ship that was transporting your omega-3 fatty acids and your B12, what if that ship sinks in the middle of the ocean? Then what are you going to do? You're going to suffer. Your health is going to suffer. So I think that a regenerative ranching, regenerative agriculture diet, and that's why earlier I said don't send your three bucks to Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Mondelez. They don't need it, and they're not going to use your three bucks to, to foister regenerative agriculture. They're going to use that to make more profits for their board of directors. You vote with your three bucks, give it to a local rancher, a local gardener, get your own livestock. If you've got the land, grow something on your balcony. If you live in the tiniest urban apartment, you can grow a few things on your balcony. We all need to be growing something. What are you growing right now? If you, if you're in an apartment and you've got a cockatiel or a parakeet, you need to give that away and buy three Coturnix quail and put in your cage. They'll give you three little eggs a day, and they're very happy, very lovable birds. They're fun to watch. They've been in captivity for over a thousand years. They're used to it. They'd rather be in a cage than, than be out in the yard. You need to be raising some of your own food or spending your money with somebody who's raising food locally and doing it right. The poor vegans are trying. They, at least they're thinking and I think be, becoming a vegan is step one in rediscovering a proper human diet for many, many people. I can't tell you how many people are now in the carnivore community who started out as vegans. And it did. It went great for a few weeks, a few months, a few years. But then all of a sudden they're like, man, I feel like shit. I, my skin looks terrible. I, my, I had a tooth fall out. I, I don't have any energy. I have this rash that won't go away. And then they eat some meat. They add some meat. So they're eating a, basically a whole food vegan diet. But they add some meat. And all of a sudden their brain wakes up. Their skin looks better. They're, they're like, man, I feel amazing. And then that's step two to rediscovering a proper human diet. And it's all downhill from there. I, I can't tell you how many vegans are now reformed vegans and are carnivores or, or eating a, a, a ketogenic diet that's full of nothing but fatty meat, eggs with the yolk, and some real vegetables. Because I hate to tell you guys, but wheat, rice, oats, corn, soybean, they ain't vegetables. That's a monocropped product that the multinational corporations sell you to make a profit for their board of directors. That is starvation food. It'll keep you from starving. Yeah. But if what your if your goal is to optimize your health, 
Grains play no role in that. Soybean plays no role in that whatsoever. Okay. All right, guys, that's it. I'm done. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. If you think this information might help somebody, please share this video with them. You're also welcome to share it on your social media. If you have a specific question for me that you did not get answered today, you can become a patron. There's a link on the YouTube live video. If you're on Instagram or TikTok, go to my YouTube video of this live. And in the show notes, there's a link. You can sign up, become a patron. It's like 20,000, 30, 40. The game ends with like like the island voice. I can't get into that because I'm not. I don't know what just happened on TikTok. That was weird. Uh, but you can become a patron. You can ask me your questions directly. We have, we have four extra live Q&As on our Patreon every week. So join us. Join our tribe. It's over 5,000 strong now and growing of people who have rediscovered a proper human diet and their health is improving every day because of it. Thanks so much, guys. I'll see you next time. Thanks on TikTok. I'll see you.